Hi, I'm Ulf Erlingsson, founder of Lindrum Incorporated and inventor of the Sedimeter. This video is about the next generation, the fourth generation Sedimeter. But before I get to that, let me go through the history a bit. I apologize if this video will be a little bit long, but I think it's going to be interesting to see the history. So let's start. The first instrument, the first commercial Sedimeter, was this one. It has a sensor here that is 15 centimeters long and a huge instrument housing for the electronics, which in, back in the days was rather big and clumsy and big batteries, and the Savonius current rotor on top. This one was made in Norway in the 1990s. Now, when that one went out of market, we started making them here in Miami, in Lindrum. And this is the second generation. As you can see, you have here a sensor that's 35 centimeters long instead of 15, and a much smaller instrument house with smaller batteries and surface-mounted electronics, which takes a lot less space, obviously, and use less power. This one also had optional pressure sensor and a light meter, no space for a current meter. Now, when that one became replaced, the next generation was this, the third generation. This one is all mounted inside a 15 millimeter outside diameter tube. Very thin walls, one millimeter. So in order to get the necessary strength, the printed circuit board is instead thicker. It's one eighth of an inch thick instead of the standard one sixteenth. So the, the strength here is almost entirely comes from the printed circuit board itself and not the tube. This one, like the others, are mounted inside a holder tube. So the user screws down a 20 millimeter diameter holder tube in the seafloor and then puts the instrument down into it. Obviously, since this one doesn't have an instrument house up here, you could actually through it, screw it down together. The, even, even though it's possible now to screw it down without the holder tube, the holder tube has its advantages because when you leave that in space, you can go out, retrieve the instrument to charge the battery, get the data out, and put the new one in at the same time as you retrieve the old one. So the holder tube that's mounted with a screw in the bottom is still very useful. But there are also other ways to mount the instrument. And uh, many users in, have applications where they cannot dive, either for regulatory reasons or for environmental reasons, that it's simply not safe to dive in that space. Could be too strong current or, current or contaminated waters. So in that case, they've been mounting this uh, instrument on a tripod or some other structure which is lowered from the surface. The problem is when you do that, you don't know how this will end up standing on the bottom. Maybe it falls over. How do you interpret the results? That's the reason in the next one, the fourth generation, we've added um, a sensor for measuring the inclination, the tilt. I'll get back to that. So apart from this version, we also had have still the version with the mechanical cleaner which has a reel here in the top and a shuttle that goes up and down and cleans it. Otherwise it's the same. It has the connector in the bottom instead of in the top which makes it harder to connect it for real-time measurement. This one with the connector in the top you can simply connect a, a cable up to a buoy or away on the seafloor to get the data out in real time or download it from time to time. The previous versions did not have any integral connectors. So SM3, the third generation, was the first to have as a standard rechargeable batteries and a connector, and no way to open it. Now, uh, we made an experiment 2017, May to June. We put out some instruments. These were two of them in Biscayne Bay, one meter depth, eight weeks exactly during the worst growing season in, of Miami in, in a lagoon. That Biscayne Bay is like a lagoon with high nutrient contents and, and 
rather poor visibility, about eight inches of vis visibility. So this was the hole the tube that this instrument was sitting in, and the cleaner was not in operation because this was the reference. And um, as you can see, we have a lot of growth of barnacles on this one. That w that's how it is for eight weeks without any anti-fouling installed. The other two had, uh, let me see here if I can put it down, here. The other two had um, copper tape installed on the rear side of the holder tube. And as you can see, nothing has grown. There are no barnacles or algae on the copper itself. And on the front, it's much less. There is some, but much less than on the, on the, one, the reference one. And this was the instrument. This is the tube in which one of the centimeters was mounted. And it was inserted until here in the holder tube. And this part up here, as you can see, lots of barnacles grew. But the top, we had copper tape all the way around, and there, there was no fouling. So copper tape is very efficient, and it even helps around the corner here. This was one inch wide tape, which covers exactly this tube, and covers almost half of this one. Here is one month of data from one of those three centimeters. And as you can see, it's perfectly possible to determine the level of the bottom, which is the black line in the data plot chart. Here in the bottom, you can also see the color plot that is created now when we have both straight and oblique measurement of backscatter. This one, the house for the battery and the motor here is made of copper nickel, which is, doesn't corrode in seawater and it has an anti-fouling effect. But in this severe case, it, there actually was some barnacles growing on this. So it was not complete protection the way the, the copper provided complete protection. Now, let me get to the, to the fourth generation. Now I told you about the development and some of the issues we've seen. Oh, one issue I didn't mention, and that is the fact that SM3 we had in added one optical backscatter detector up here in addition to the one we had in SM2. And the reason was to detect when the shuttle comes up to the parking position. But um, we realized then that this one, we could actually put a turbidimeter up here. The, the way this instrument works, the centimeter sensor itself it has these 36 optical backscatter detectors that measures a vertical profile of the turbidity in the, from below the bottom to above the bottom, through the water bottom interface. And based on that profile of turbidity, which might look, if I plot it, it might look something like this. Based on that profile, the instrument estimates where the bottom level is and reports that out. So both the profile and the estimated level comes to the PC. And then the software in the PC has interactive functions with which the user can make a better estimation. Because in some cases, the instrument is unable to do. The instrument will always tend to err on the side of putting the bottom too high. And that's because that level determination is used to control the shuttle. So we don't want the instrument to try to run the shuttle down below the bottom. So therefore, the error is on purpose, always on the high side. Now, the problem with this turbidity determination through the holder tube is, of course, that there is much internal reflections in the holder tube. And therefore, there is no absolute, there is no good absolute determination of turbidity, only relative. The error gets rather big here. We're talking about 800 FTU or so of extra reflection. 
So in order to measure the turbidity in the water, we need to have a turbidity sensor that's not mounted behind the holder tube. And that's why in the fourth generation, we now have an instrument that has only the centimeter part of the sensor with 15 millimeter diameter. And the higher part of the instrument has 20 millimeter diameter. And when you place that in the holder tube, the holder tube, the instrument will be inserted until here. And this part up here will always have only one layer of plastic in front of the sensors. And then we've added here, we've added a laser diode right up there. It's a laser that sends out infrared light. And here is a little barrier to block light from going the straight way back. And down here, the black dot there, the black square, is a photo detector for infrared light, near infrared light. So with that, we get 90 degree measurement of turbidity in near infrared, which is the ISO definition of the turbidity, ISO 2027, I think it is. But we've also added a white LED up there below the, the laser. And down here, that little thing that's shining a bit, that's a photo detector, a photodiode for visible light with the same sensitivity curve as the human eye. So with that, we can measure the turbidity with the US method, the EPA method. And now I'm getting to some other point, which is anti-fouling. One new method of anti-fouling is to use ultraviolet light to prevent fouling. And here we have a little yellow dot up there and a little yellow dot there that are ultraviolet LEDs that will shine and expose this area of the sensor and this area of the sensor to ultraviolet light to discourage fouling. There you have an antimicrobial effect. Don't look at it because it also hurts the human eye. It gives you cataracts. So use glasses whenever you use this, and that's why we have these glasses to protect the eyes. These are ultraviolet blocking. Now, as we have these, um, now that we have these, ultraviolet LED, and we have the sensor for, you, for visible light down there, we can also measure the reflected visible light when we emit ultraviolet light up here. And what does that give us? It gives us a fluorescence detector. We don't know yet because we haven't tested, but we will, how useful this is going to be. But one of the possible uses of this is to detect hydrocarbons because hydrocarbons are fluorescent. So it's possible that when there has been an oil spill, for instance, and sediment particles are polluted with hydrocarbons, that it will be possible to measure it here. It remains to be determined. But the possibility is there and didn't cost anything extra. It just cost a few lines extra of code to do that measurement. And down here, as I said, we have put in an accelerometer. It's located right there. Right there. It's a three-dimensional accelerometer which, let me get to that here. The accelerometer measures the x, y, and z. Actually, the, the x is the dimension that goes towards you here. The y is the direction that goes towards me, and the z is the upwards. So when it's located correctly in the water, that should be zero on the x, zero on the y, and minus one on the Z. Now, this can be used to measure the tilt, and that was the original intention. But we actually decided to store uh, 20 or 30 data, depending on the resolution you decide to put out. You can have 8-bit or 12-bit resolution. So with 12-bit resolution, you have a, res an, a resolution of 0.001G, very high accuracy, 
12 bits. So the scale is from plus minus 2G. And it will store 20 measurements. 20 measurements and the measurement hurt in, in default, the measurement frequency in default is 10 hertz. This means that since this instrument, since this accelerometer doesn't use much power, we have it measuring all the time with 10 hertz. And when it's time for a measurement, the instrument simply goes in and takes out from the FIFO memory, first in, first out memory, the last 20 measurements and stores them. So every measurement, we find out the vibrations the last two seconds. And then the software calculates the vibration RMS and the maximum acceleration it has experienced in these two seconds. And now we get to another interesting possibility, condition-based monitoring. Because the accelerometer is able to set a flag, an interrupt flag to the processor, so that when the processor, it wakes up every second to update the clock. So every second when it wakes up, it's checking, has the accelerometer set a flag? And if it has, it will do an extra measurement. This means that apart from the regularly timed measurements, if there is some event like shaking, being hit, or changing angle, there will be an extra measurement made which will store approximately 10 accelerometer measurements before the event and 10 accelerometer measurements after the event. Approximately, I say, because it depends on where in the second this happens. And also to prevent that extra, if it starts vibrating, let's say, because when, when there is a strong current, the vortices that are created behind a circular object in water can make it start vibrating slightly. So if it starts vibrating during a strong current, to prevent it from measuring every second, first of all, there is a hold off, so it will not measure until after two seconds. So you can never take repeat measurements of the same data. And second, every time it does an extra measurement, it raises the threshold one notch for a new extra measurement. So it can never take more extra measurements than there are levels. That means that it will always, it should always be able during your deployment to pick up the strongest accelerometer event during that deployment. All right, so those, uh, yes, I mentioned, I mentioned here already the, the isoturbidimeter, the near infrared. It also uh, records the background near infrared light. Once you're underwater by more than a foot or so, there should be no background light. So if there is a background near infrared, it pretty much means it's been exposed to daylight. And the white turbidimeter, which is the EPA style, will also measure the daylight, the daylight sensor here. Light sensor measures the daylight. Of course, ideally it should be mounted like this to measure incident daylight, but it's mounted like this, so it will measure horizontally and below the barrier. But still it gives an indication of the level of light down there on the bottom. And it, as I said, it measures the fluorescence. We send out ultraviolet light by, uh, with a frequency of approximately 367 nanometer and the daylight sensor has a limit of approximately 400 nanometer so it, there is some in some visible light sent out by the uv led because you can see it but most the vast majority of the light emitted is invisible to the human eye but it damages the the eye. So tests here show that if you put a white object in front of this, which is not fluorescent, you will get a stronger value of the, of the EPA turbidity than fluorescence. But if you put a piece of white paper, which is highly fluorescent, you will get a stronger value here than here. So by comparing the two, we expect it to be possible to determine if the sediment in the water are fluorescent or not. 
course, we still don't know what the, what the, what level of fluorescence is required and if it's going to be useful or not. I cannot make any promise of that, but I can promise that we will investigate it and report back. All right, and then, as I said here, we have the ultraviolet light for helping with the anti-fouling. And I didn't mention, but we also have a, a vibrator up here, because in some situations where you put it down, especially indoors in laboratory settings, it, you tend to get bubbles formed on the surface. So it's a good idea to run the vibrator. It will shake it. It's the same kind of vibrator as in a cell phone. It will shake it and make the bubbles leave. Uh, also, some particles that attach with electric forces can be sh shook off that way. And um, then the copper tape. This copper tape is very effective, but it's virtually permanent. It's hard to get it off, virtually impossible to get it off. And the idea is to apply copper tape on the rear side of the holder tube. And then, we, of course, when you put it down, you have to be careful. So you put, this, put it in such a way that the sensors are pointing forward and you don't cover the sensors with the copper tape. And in this part up here, we have to leave the window open where the turbidimeter sensors are and the ultraviolet light will keep this clear. And we have to leave a little bit open up here where the LEDs are for user interface. It's a blue one for indicating that it's connected to power, red one for charging, green for fully charged, and then one yellow and one green for communication. So that has to be left, but the rest can actually be covered by copper tape. So, oh, I should say also, we'll make this in, in versions. The only difference is the size of the battery. This is the smallest battery, a AAA. It has about 300 milliamp hours, not very much. It doesn't give much power to the UV LEDs, but it's enough for measurements. The other version will make will have a, a battery that's about maybe five, six, maybe up to ten times bigger. We'll see how big we can fit in the tube. And it will have a little bit thicker section up here, one inch diameter, to fit this large battery. Because all that extra power is essentially going to be used for the UV anti-fouling here. All right, that's the next version. It's available to be ordered. And, oh, one thing I didn't mention, to stabilize it, we are putting in a half round stainless steel piece in the bottom. Up here, the, the tube now is so thick that it's not needed. So it's available for orders, and uh, we expect to have a delivery time of, of about three to four weeks. And uh, I hope we're going to sell a lot of it. And when you do need to replace it, we can replace the battery or if the sensor get dirty you can send it back here we'll take the inter interiors out of the tube and put it inside a new holder tube and seal it again and that way you'll get away with a virtually like new instrument for much less cost than buying a new one just by replacing the outside thank you for watching and welcome to lindorm.com <laughs>